Okay. Okay. All right, welcome uh, to our small group of participants here. Um, because we are so small, we, we can let everybody unmute and just ask you to, you know, maybe keep it muted while still people are speaking, but you can unmute to ask questions and participate since there are so few of us. Um, I'm going to share my whole screen and you'll see the, our presentation, but I just want to give a brief welcome. Uh, my name is Christy Post. I'm the Director of uh, Marketing and Communications for the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Um, and this is one of our FLT Connect events. This is a series of free online workshops and presentations um, on a whole variety of topics. We've covered everything from tick prevention to uh, uh, hiking safety for women to gearing up. We've gone to gear shopping I'm out of Buffalo, um, how, to, how to read our maps, and now this one. Um, so tonight we're talking about hiking with dogs, and we have some really great presenters who I'm going to let introduce themselves. Um, but if if, our, if if you are not a member of the Finger Lakes Trail Conference, um, we are a, a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and we are funded almost entirely by membership dues and donations. So everything that we do is, is funded by membership dues and donations, and that includes all the trail building, trail maintenance, trail projects. Um, and all of our communications and all of our special events uh, like this one. Um, we have a whole series of free hiking events um, and, and, and different programs. So I encourage you to, to visit our website if you haven't already and uh, consider becoming a member if you are not. And if you are a member, I want to thank you for being a member and for supporting the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start this presentation. Give me a second. Ooh. So tonight we are talking about hiking with dogs. Um, our agenda, we're going to do some introductions and then we're going to, we have, we kind of broke out our conversation into a couple different areas, planning your adventure, food, water, and other supplies, trail etiquette, and then tips from a trainer. Uh, Trisha Kennedy, one of our, our, our presenters is a professional dog trainer. Uh, throughout the presentation, you will see pictures of some lovely dogs. Those are the dogs of your presenters and your moderator this evening. Um, here on the left, you've got Trip, which is Peg's dog, and he's very handsome. And Chidi on the right, who's my dog. And I say he's the handsomest, but I saw this picture of Trip and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Give it. And she, my daughter says, let me look, let me look. <laughs> She's got to see. Um, they're, they're very handsome. So uh, let's go first and do some introductions. Uh, so Lisa Barrett is a, a Finger Lakes Trail uh, officer. She's our, our finance director. What's your uh, VP for finance? VP of finance. Thank you. Um, so Lisa, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit. I don't bit. recognize the picture because my hair was really long. <laughs> I was up on Virgil Mountain last fall. Wow. Anyways, I'm a member of the FLT and the VP of finance for the FLTC, and I am currently working on my end-to-end -end of the Finger Lakes Trail. I have about 60 miles left to go. Um, four hikes left, um, I'll be done in September. And my little white border collie, Annie, there has hiked probably about 400 of those miles with me. And um, that's me. All right, and Peg? Hi, um, I'm one of the uh, FLTC board members and I'm the program chair for a lot of the activities uh, with the FLT. I'm also <clears throat> president, president of our local hiking club here in Norwich, the Bull Thistle Hiking Club. And I am a trail maintainer uh, for the uh, club, which covers the FLT. I hike uh, often uh, with my dogs. Uh, I have, I currently have three dogs and I'm, I'm pretty in tune with the different capabilities of my dogs and who should go on group hikes, who shouldn't go on group hikes, um, the distance, the environment, that that kind of thing. So I do enjoy hiking with the dogs, but sometimes I just can't take them. It's just not, not appropriate. But I'm I'm hoping everybody enjoys tonight's pre presentation. All right, and then Trisha Kennedy and Trisha's picture here on the right with her dog Olive. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a professional dog trainer. Olive is my partner. Um, she's the only dog in my household that actually earns a living. Um, so she gets, she now and again gets special trail treatment. Um, so 
I like to do a lot of hiking. I encourage my clients to hike. It's just great bonding. Um, it's a great way to work on skills in challenging environments where there's a lot going on. Olive happens to be a um, very much a fan favorite of the squirrel. So it gives my clients a chance to get out, work on things like recall, um, walking skills, um, and also practicing, you know, dog greetings and etiquette on the trail when we meet other people and other dogs. So it's just a fun thing to be able to mix into the training that I do. Excellent. Oops. Okay, hold on. There we go. So first we're going to talk through uh, planning your adventure and considerations for dogs. So um, first we want to talk a little bit about length and difficulty of the hike terrain, et cetera. Like what are the considerations when you bring your dog? Um, so I think Peg, Peg, let, let's start with you because you kind of alluded to this about there are some hikes you take your dogs on and some that you don't and you have a good sense of that. Right. Um, with our, with our local hike group, one of our hike leader. She likes to do a lot of um, bushwhacking type hikes. And I'll call him and say, can I bring my dog? And we've had a lot of conversations over the years about what's appropriate, where we're going. If there's no trail involved and we don't know if we're going to be going through uh, steep inclines, um, uncharted territory. And then also there's some spots that I hike where I find out that there's dogs that are loose like people have dogs out in our yards around here a lot and you know if you hike the same area often enough you know where those are and it's like probably not a good place for me to bring them I don't like bringing trip on a, a bushwhacking type hike if I'm going with other people and other dogs I can't bring my female dog because she's not that great with other dogs so um my max length for trip is pretty much four, four miles. And if I'm dealing with bad weather, you know, um, if it's, if I know there's potential of rain and I'm going on a group hike with people, people don't, don't have a problem hiking in the rain, but honestly, my dog, my, especially my one dog, he hates hiking in the rain. And it's like, I, I won't take them if there's a chance of rain. So that, that's my, um, my take on it. Lisa, what about we, as you're, as you're planning your end to end, like, how do you go about planning, you know, for length and for terrain and all of that stuff? Well, I'm really lucky because most, a lot of that I'm hiking with a couple that has a 15 year old chocolate lab. <coughs> Excuse me. So we keep it at what he's comfortable hiking, and that's about seven to eight miles. I've got done um, hikes, not with the older dog, but Annie and I have done hikes. And we, the most we've done is 12 miles, but I, I really, um, I'm not rushing. I really, um, we take our time and have lots of water and snack and rest breaks. So, so. and then she's, she just turned five, so she can do, I think as the year as the years tick on for her, our mileage per hike will be going down. <laughs> and we were saying before the, uh, everyone came in the room that this past weekend was a good example of seasonal considerations when we had some kind of extreme heat. So, uh, what kind of things do you do you do to plan for extreme heat situations or or cold, whatever the extremes might be, or wet? <laughs> Well, I don't. I don't take Annie out if there's deep snow because she gets she's long hair and she just gets balls of stuff caught in her fur and then it's you know it's unpleasant for everybody. So if there's snow on the ground or ice, she's probably not going to go. Um, if it's hot and humid, which a lot of the hiking is, and I just really take it slow. We, you know, I watch her tongue. And if her tongue's hanging out and looks like a lollipop, then we really need to stop. I try not to let it look like a lollipop. I try to stop ahead of time and, and just give her lots of water and snacks and rest breaks. And I, I know with um, 
with us. I have um, quilted jackets for the dogs in extreme cold temperatures. Um, I've tried boots and I have not had success with hiking boots. Um, I've tried a few different brands. I haven't given up on the topic, but um, you know, I don't do long hikes in the snow. We have snowshoed um, with the dogs, but I don't do long snowshoes. So I keep, keep that in mind um, uh, when we're, when we're hiking in the, in the, uh, in the snow. In extreme, extreme temperatures, I'm not going out in either direction. So if it's, if we're talking 20 degrees or colder, it's gonna be a shorter duration for me and under zero, I'm not going out. And over, over 85, 90, there's no way I'm, I'm going any length with the dogs. I would probably just stay on my property because it's, it's, too, it's too much for, for um, mine. I have two that are pretty heavier coat and um, I wouldn't chance it just because I know their personalities. And we were saying too, before everybody came in that talking about thunderstorms and about just planning ahead for the weather. And I think Peg said you, you would just, you wouldn't take your dog if you, if there are forecasts for thunderstorms. Yeah, it, um, I, I like to watch the forecast. I don't like hiking in thunderstorms. I have been out there um, when storms have kicked up and the wind starts and as a group, leader for hikes our thing is we get out of the woods before it gets bad because we don't want trees falling on us at all so um i try not to take the dogs out if there's a forecast for thunderstorms trip hates hates it really hates hiking in the rain we've been out there and um you know a storm kicks up thankfully it wasn't thunder but it was heavy rain and I, I mean, if looks could kill, that's how uh, he would, he'd be walking, he'd turn back and look at me and walk a little further and turn <laughs> back and look at me. I, he was not, he was not happy at all. So I'll, I'll never forget that particular hike because it was a longer, long one. And he, 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 was, he, he doesn't like the rain, but um, I think also like what Lisa said, if you're out there, and you see something with your dog, you need to stop and evaluate. And, you know, being prepared, you know, is one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit about how to be prepared. But Lisa's already said, you know, water, have lots of water. And that's for in the winter too. You know, you need to have water for your dogs hiking in the winter. It's not just a hot weather thing. Um, Hydration is important in all seasons. Um, so let's talk about restrictions and regulations about there are places where you can and cannot hike with dogs or places where your dogs have to be unleashed in leashes of different um, lengths. Uh, Lisa, is your, is your, your, you talked a little bit about this when we were planning. So I don't know if you wanna elaborate and talk maybe about how you're planning for your end to end in terms of where you can and cannot bring Annie and when. Um. The main trail, I don't think there are any restrictions on dogs on the main trail. I know some of the branch trails do. And a lot of the trail goes through state parks and state park rules are dogs must be on a leash no longer than six feet. I started out hiking with Annie um, Loose and she is very reactive to the scent of deer. She will stand in the forest and stare a deer down and not move, but if she smells it, she's gone. So one day in the Catskills, uh, I really had the feeling I wasn't going to be able to call her back and I had to use my really angry mommy voice, which I hate to use. And she, anyways, she's been on a leash ever since. I started out with a 10 or 12 foot line on her and just realized she was getting wrapped around trees and just, you know, getting into stuff I didn't want her to get into. So we've just gone to a leather, a nice quality leather six foot leash and she's on it all the time. And so I don't have to worry about it. The other thing with the um, the leashes, there's some sections of state forest that um, New York DEC requires 
leashes. So you should always check um, where you're hiking, whether it's your local, you know, park or on the FLT. Um, find out what the requirements are and, you know, keep your dog safe while you're out there. Um, one of a question I have um, that I want Lisa to cover is she tethers um, a leash to her. Just explain to everybody what that is and, and why you do so, it. So this is my pack and it carries all of Andy's stuff and a few items of much for myself. And I have, let me find the right side here. I do. Annie's helping me right now. So I have a carabiner on the waist strap. So that carabiner, the end of the leash goes right on it. So I am hands-free. And if she were to pull, which till we really figured the system out, she will pull. Her pulling is around my, is against my waist and not my shoulders or my upper arm. Um, the thing with that is you have to really know your dog. Your dog has to really know you because when you're going down a hill, or going over a log or even going up a hill or water crossing, you have to really know what your animal is gonna do in that situation. I, a deeper water crossing, a longer water crossing with slippery rocks, I will take the leash off of her and she'll go across and she's learned now when she gets across the water, she has to stop and wait for me to put it back on the leash. So being having her tethered to me can be a safety issue, um, but I'm aware of it and we've worked through it enough and, and she knows the system, so. And I also use a tether and what I've trained my dogs is that it's got a little, it's the rough wear and it's got a little bit of bungee on it. So it gives me an extra two foot stretch. And I've, I've taught Olive, my hiking bud, that as soon as she starts to feel the tightening of the stretch she knows to stop and pull back so instead of reaching the end of it and there being a jerk um even if she you know sends a deer and starts to take off as soon as she hits that slowdown she knows okay that's it I gotta return let's talk briefly about I, I, can I interject oh sure I Sorry, Christy. This is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, yeah, I have um, contacted Lisa about this at one time. I still, I need you to go a little further with this. I just would not trust. I don't even know where to begin with my lab. Um, she's just pulls. She just wants to be in the water. I mean, and I, can you just explain so this is, further yep. how this yep. is going to work? So this is the harness that Annie wears when we're hiking. It's padded. It's it's super, you know, thick and heavy and strong. And that other end of her leash is attached to the ring on this. And this sits around her middle back. So okay. yep, I have one, one of those. On the middle of her back and one end is attached to my waist of my backpack. I, um, it took me a real... The first year I hiked with her, it was horrible because all she was doing was pulling and a, hike, and a pulling dog is not fun to hike with. Right. I realized I had never leash trained this. She's my last dog. She was a puppy when she came to me and I've always had great fenced in yards. I had never leash trained this dog. So I realized going back to square one, I had to teach her what a leash was. And it, and it was maybe two sessions and she went, oh, when I feel that pressure on the harness, and she's feeling it on her chest, I need to stop. First hike of the spring, she's excited. She wants to go. She slams the end of that leash and she's still pulling and I become a tree and I completely stop and I do not move until she turns and looks at me and reconnects with me. Once she's connected to me and she, and she goes, oh, okay, I'm on the leash. Okay, now I understand what we're doing. So it's just that, the, the repetition and the consistency of she's if she's pulling, I'm not moving. She wants me to move and keep moving, and I'm going to stop. And I stop dead in my tracks, and I do not budge until she turns and looks at me and reconnects with me. And then we continue on the trip. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I know it's going to take practice. It does. 
<laughs> I, I mean, but and now, uh, what about ticks? Are you? Is that a big concern too? Do, do you want to talk about that now, Christy? Or oh, later? sorry. Okay. Okay. No, Never we mind. Can, we can we can go down. To, that that's not in our agenda, but we'll get to it in the Q and A. Yeah, um, okay. Yep. And and that's probably that's actually probably something in the the supplies. I'm sure somebody curious. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not that that supply girl. Um, but let's talk briefly about um, uh, hiking or with your dog during hunting season. Uh, what to be aware of and what to do, what not to do. Um, well, we um, we actually have state land not far from my house and. The land behind me is all um, people that hunt, like there's no houses. So I'm surrounded by hunters for the most part. Um, our hiking club does hike year round, all seasons. But when it gets to be gun season, we put a, a notice out, like it's gun season, you may wanna stay out of the woods for a few weeks. So, you know, I, I avoid being in the woods when it's gun season. I will road, road hike, but all, all hunting seasons, I put a reflective vest on my dogs. So even if it's turkey season, you know, the month of May was turkey season, they, they can have a re reflective vest and I have different weights of vests. So I have a winter one and I have a summer one. So it's reflective. They also have bear bells on them. Um, so my dogs jingle and jangle um as we're going through so even if i'm not actively talking to them which i spend a lot of time if i'm just with my dogs i still talk um but if i'm with people we're usually talking we we tend to make noise so um people know we're coming and animals know we're coming too but the reflective vest a bear bell is great for um hunters to know that you're out there um but i do avoid actually being on in the woods when it's um what is it about six weeks of gun season three weeks uh it's not that it's not that long i could i could live with it um but that's what i that's how i deal with hunting season and it's important to note if you are hiking on the flt to, to always you know be checking on on trail conditions and checking on, on the maps to, to for active hunting closures so that you're not someplace that you're not supposed to be. And that's just good practice with or without your dog. Right. And and this, the state forests, um, when the Finger Lakes Trails goes through the state forest, they don't close it for hunt, hunting. Like there's right. not a hunting closure. So you're allowed to hike there, but there's hunters that are allowed to hunt there. Yeah. So I weigh my options and I go, well, it's gun season. I don't want to be out there, you know, while they're, they're hunting, so I, I won't go. Um, there's seasonal roads. There's a couple places I could go that there's no hunting um, allowed at all. But I think a, a good, good you know, orange vest for your dog and a bell will help. Um, or just, you know, stay out of the woods for now. All right, so we wanted to talk about food, water, and other supplies. What do you bring with you? One of the things that I learned and, and made note of was having identification both on my dog and in my pack, which is not something that I had thought of before. So let's talk about, let's talk first about food and snacks and how much water to bring. And, and then we can move to leashes and harnesses. And, and on from there. So food and food snacks and water, how much water to bring for how long? And I know that varies depending on. Well, I carry two of these, I think they're like 24 ounce water bottles and one on each corner pocket of my pack. So I can just reach around and grab it without having to take my pack off. I have a collapsible water bowl that hangs off the front of my pack so I don't have to pick my pack off to get to it. Um, about the first 15 minutes of a hike, I'll stop and give her a drink. And about half hour to an hour in, I'll stop and get her a, 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 a snack. I carry a pound of cooked chicken breast, boneless, skinless chicken breast with me. I, it, it's in two different Ziploc bags. So it's a half a pound in each packet. It goes in my pack in the morning frozen. 
by the time it's time to eat, it does, she doesn't care if it's frozen or not, but even at the end of the day, it's still okay because it's been cold. Carrie, um, so she has a separate water bowl. This is a collapsible food bowl that her chicken goes in. I don't mix her chicken in her water. I don't want to drink out of a, my glass that's had food in it, so she doesn't either. Um, I carry snacks and a, a, a treat bag that I use for either positive reinforcement or sometimes she'll turn and look at me and she'll say she's hungry, but we're not in a safe place to actually stop. Like if we're on a busy road, I'm not gonna stop on the side of a busy road and give her a, give her a break and have her eat half a pound of chicken. Um, so I, I try to carry for water. I try to carry twice what I know she's gonna need and I carry twice what I'm gonna need. Um, I have emptied her water, bowl, her water bottles before. Again, we hike up to nine, 10, 11, 12 miles. And I know at the end of that hike, her, her water bottles should be empty. And I, I have water in the car waiting for when we get back. So she has uh, more water to drink in the, in the car on the back. Trisha, I know you carry a pack even on the shortest of hikes. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what you, you carry with you and Sure, sure. Yeah, I always have my snacks, uh, not a surprise, both for just it, if it's a long endurance hike or a hard endurance hike. And also I just for positive reinforcement, um, you know, and I'm not necessarily expecting my dog to do specific things. I'm looking for things to reward her for. So good choices where she sees a couple of squirrels playing normally might be a little too interested in them, but instead looks back at me. Um, I do the same as what Lisa said, double water. Um, I also carry with me, so I've got, I've got food in my pack, but I also have my treat bag and I like that because I can have that right on the front of me. So that, that's got treats in it and a couple of little things that I might use along the way, like lip, lip balm. Um, but I also carry an air horn because if I ever am, um, you know, I, I don't use it as a first line of defense, but if a dog were to come after us and I'm not gonna wait and see if it's gonna actually physically attack us, you know, the air horn is relatively harmless. Um, the only reason I don't use it right away is I don't wanna scare my own dog if I don't have to. But if there's a dog bearing down on me, showing me their teeth, I'm not gonna wait and see if they're gonna take a bite out of olive. Um, I'll spray the horn. I, I have, it is always 100% of the time worked. So that's why I like, another reason I like to have the pouch right there. I can grab it and use it. It's ready to go. Um, I also carry ID. I oddly carry an extra pair of glasses because without my glasses and I have fallen, um, it would be really hard for us to get back. Um, so I carry that. Um, tissues, but that's really, that's usually it for me, unless it's a much longer hike. I like that every time that you're hiking, I think you're always also working on training your own dog. Yes. And your dog oh. is very well trained because you are a professional trainer, but it's like, <laughs> you're always very conscious of, of working with her. I like that. If I've got a leash on her, I have my tree pouch on 100% of the time. Um, and a lot of the time I don't even touch them, but knowing they're there, because surprises happen all the time, whether in the woods, on a sidewalk, in the road. And I just always want to be able to reinforce good choices that both my dogs make and clients' dogs that I'm working with make. Lisa, do you want to talk about where you have identification? Because I remember just being. Sure. Well, she has, you know, the regular stuff on her collar. And then I carry in my hand in the back here in that little pocket where your wallet and car keys and stuff would go that if somebody found you dead on the trail, that's the, did it fall out? 
Oh, it's right here. That handy dandy little pocket when they found just sprawled on the trail, they would look in there. I have a piece of paper in a Ziploc bag that's called emergency plan. And then it says in case of an event, I have this in my car too. So this is in case of a car accident and, the, and you find this dog and it's my name, her name, her date of birth, any medications she's on. Um, she's on medication for thyroid. She has a special prescription diet. There's contact list of emergency contact and yes, Peg, you're on it. And then it says, um, do not take her to a shelter. Here are vet, I have three different vets depending on what state I'm in. Those names and numbers are listed in what state they're in. And I say, don't take her to a shelter, take her to a vet. Call these people, these people will come and, and get her. So that's in the pocket of my pack where, like I said, if, if somebody found me on the trail, that's the pocket you would look to find somebody's ID and such. So. Right, and then another idea with the uh, IDs, um, I think, you know, the four presenters here pretty much like harnesses um, as opposed to a collar. When you have a leash on your dog, the harness, because of how it pulls on the body, different than a, than a, than a collar. So we like the harnesses. But I also still put a collar on my dog. The collar has the ID tags on it and the harness has the ID tags on it. Because what if somehow he slipped out of the harness and now he took off and all he has is the collar, you know, he ha mine has the collar, but a lot of people put one or the other. But I, I like having something in an emergency um, just in case. And uh, I also know people that hike with their dogs that carry in their backpack an extra collar and an extra leash. Mm -hmm. Because what if something happens? What if the leash snaps, the collar breaks? What, you know, to have an extra one on you um, doesn't hurt. Um, and while we're talking about leashes, I know Lisa explained her, her the, the tether and, and Trisha explained the tether. Um, over the years, and you know, between, you know, the three or four of us, we've dealt with a lot, a lot of dogs. And we don't use uh, retractable leashes. Mm -hmm. And for a hike in the woods, I would think a retractable leash would be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, Trisha, maybe you want to address that a little better than me. Yeah, they, first of all, they're much more liable to break. Um, they get caught up in things. If they get wrapped around, for any of you who have had it happen, they get wrapped around your ankle. Oh my goodness, what a burn you'll get. Um, it, and for me, it's too big to hold on to. If I've got my dog, Right. And I might be reaching for something out of my pack, grabbing a water, giving my dog a treat. You just can't manage that much. Um, so not only is it bad for the dog, it's also bad for the handler. Um, and the other thing is, I want to know how far my dog can go. So even though I've got the tether with a little bit of stretch on, Believe me, I know to the millimeter how far Olive can get, even at her fastest charge. Um, so I'm never going to make a mistake and think I locked it and didn't. And all of a sudden, my dog's two, two you know, feet closer to something, whether it be a skunk, another dog, a child, whatever it might be, than I thought they were going to be. Um, I want to know exactly where I stand. All right. And, and Lisa, you mentioned um, that you also have a pack that you can carry Annie out. So you can like drag your backpack, but actually carry I'm her. Talking about the first date stuff now? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's, I thought fell in with Lisa's leashes and harness. Okay, <laughs> we might as well. So you can see in the picture, that's Annie and I at uh, one of the Blue Spur Trails in Letchworth last fall. Um, she also wears a reflective vest. She has a yellow one and a pink one. Um, I use this, I actually spray this with um, tick and flea, re tick repellent before we hike. So, and she's, so she's covered with, and then I wipe the rest of her. So, and Sarah, you can see in that picture, you can see that brown, line that's going from my waist down to in front of my left leg 
That's her six foot long leash. And you can see it's just dropped to the ground and, and it goes up and it's attached to her harness. So what I also carry is, because like I said, the big pack is carrying all her stuff. I have, uh, besides her first aid kit, I have, it's called a pack a paw rescue harness. Um, she's 40 plus pounds. And it occurred to me one day that if there was an accident and I had to carry her out, you know, I'm five miles from my car, 40 plus pounds isn't that much, but it's going to get heavy. And I realized, well, I could drag her out, but I really don't want to drag my dog out. So I have this, like I knock on wood, I've never had to use it. I have um, put it on her so she knows what it is. Um, but it just, it, so it, it folds up into this little tiny thing and it just sits in my pack. And it basically is a, can you tell I've never opened it lately? It basically is a backpack. You put her head through this hole, hind legs through this hole, and it's, it turns into a backpack and, you, and she would be on my back and I'd be carrying her out and dragging the backpack rather than dragging the dog. So I also have her a little tiny first aid kit for people and a huge first aid kit for her. And there's um, Benadryl, the stuff that doesn't have the xylitol, which is poisonous to dogs. Um, I have a little syringe. That big thing is if she gets bit by something, I want to be able to get some antihistamine in for her. I have rubber gloves. I have um, antibiotic ointment. I have gauze pads and I have a big roll of vet wrap for her. So, and I have little, you know, sterile tips. If she had a wound, I had to clean out. So does that answer the question, Christy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a really big first aid kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's twice the size of the one for the people. <laughs> uh, the other, the, the last thing I want to talk about on this page, so we've addressed the air horns, is the refuse bags. We talked about uh, what did what to do with poop. So, leave no trace. Says you know, he, all. Uh, poops <laughs> that aren't animal poops should be 80 miles off the trail or away from water, et cetera, et cetera. But dogs aren't going to walk any miles. They're going to go. When they're going to go, they're going to go. So, you know, it's best to, to pick it up and, and, and carry it out. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real stickler about this one. So I, I carry, I was telling Lisa in another conversation that I carry, like I bring, I carry a multiple gallon Ziploc bags and I always have my, you know, dog poop bags with me. And I'll put the do little dog poop bag, the, the ones that come on a roll inside like two or more Ziploc bags, gallon Ziploc bags and, and carry it out of my pack so that I'm always bringing it out. Um, but then Lisa found this thing online that uh, she ordered. So Lisa. <laughs> so I was listening to Christy say she carries all these Ziploc bags and that's not very environmentally friendly. So just so you know, my poop bags are tied to the leash. So at the handle end, so they're right there handy when I need them. So I went online and I said, "There's somebody's thought of this before, right? I don't want to carry all these Ziploc bags with me. So this is a, called a Tough Mutt. I don't know if you can see that. It's a poop bag, poop, poop, a poop bag bag. It has a little zipper thing and you, the little dis, uh, dispenser for your bags. But it has this zip in the, and you put the full poop bag in it and it's lined. And supposedly it doesn't smell. I have not, I, I, I'm hiking this weekend, so I'll know by the weekend if it works or not. It has a strap on it. You can just tie it around, clip it around your waist, or you can just put it on your, clip it to your backpack. So this is, you know, it, it's rugged. I'm impressed with the quality of it. And we'll find out if it's I'm waiting for the report and then I'm going to probably order that because <laughs> I do carry a lot of Ziploc bags and sometimes right. yeah right right not the best we'll see and but then I'll you know with with carrying a poop out you know if you're using plastic bags the key point is you know make sure you carry them out and dispose of them properly mm -hmm. um you know we don't want leaving you know double garbage out there by leaving a poop bag out there unfortunately we've seen that um with some hikers i think they pick it up and then like a mile into their hike they're going i'm not carrying this anymore 
and then they leave it in a plastic bag, which is so much worse. Or they've had it tied to their pack and they accidentally drop it. I've had that well, happen. Yeah. Well, that that's a, that's that's an honest mistake, but I've seen it so often that I know it's not just falling off people's bags. <laughs> Or have the best intentions of picking it up and maybe don't. My, I ran with a friend of mine this morning. And her dog pooped like really shortly into our loop run. And so she left it and we went back and picked it up. But we're both sticklers about it. So we definitely went back and picked it up. But, but with like with this, with this page, you know, we're talking about, you know, carrying a lot of things. And some people might think we overdo it with everything that we carry. But you want to carry more than what you think your dog is going to need and having the food like they they burn so much energy on a hike and it's not just the physical energy but it's the mental energy too with so many sights and smells and it's so much fun to make sure they have the food and the water to keep them going is is very important and you never know what's going to happen so having those first aid supplies um you know you don't want to be stranded in the woods and have to make a decision do i leave the dog here and go get help and come back and you know like don't put yourself in in that situation just put a few extra things in your in your backpack um i've actually had i mean that's my backpack is a lot of stuff because i have a two liter water bladder in there too and all this other stuff on this particular hike because we came and went back out to the main letchworth trail uh, I heard a crack over my head and I had a split second to make a decision which way I was going because the branch was coming down and something pushed me. <laughs> my guardian angel must have been tired that day out of the way and I fell backwards. This is the second time that full pack has saved my head because when you fall backwards on that, it cushions you. And I slipped on a slippery bridge once and same thing my head would have been down on that wood and i would have been banging the back of my head if it wasn't for that full pack so <laughs> you know it sounds like i carry a lot of stuff for annie but all of annie stuff in that pack is saved my head twice that i remember so the big giant pillow it is it, it's i'm thankful for it well let's talk about uh trail etiquette and encountering other hikers on the trail, encountering other hikers with dogs on the trail and encountering other animals on the trail. And I think there's a lot to talk about here. Um, let's start with encountering other hikers um, and, and sort of what, what, is, what are best practices for us as hikers with dogs? Well, I know um, not everybody likes dogs and to those of us who love dogs, it's quite alarming. And a lot of us are like, but my dog is friendly. My dog wouldn't hurt anybody. It's okay. No, it's not okay. If somebody's afraid of a dog and they probably have very good reasons why they're afraid of the dog, we have to respect that. So if I see somebody coming up the trail, I pull off to the side and I step out of the way and let them pass. Now, a lot of the people I encountered her like, oh my God, he's so cute. You know, I love dogs. Can I pet him? That's different. Then I have seen people, you could see the people shaking in fear over the fact that there's a dog on a trail. Doesn't matter that they're on a leash. They are terrified of your dog. So just always keep that in mind. You don't know what that person's um, experience has been. So if you leash or no leash if that if your dog now runs up to someone who's terrified of dogs what's their reaction going to be are they going to kick your dog now that's really going to take you off and be upset if they kick your dog you know so keep your dog close to you and find out what you know if that person wants to say hello to your dog if you want them to say hello to your dog you may not want anybody to say hello to your dog you know but have that in your mind before it occurs and what you should do I do the same thing, Peg. I see somebody coming up the trail, whether they have another dog with them or not. Um, I step off the trail and um, ask her to sit quietly and connect with me. And that's when she gets one of the treats that are in the treat, treat bag on my way. Um, I use that as a training opportunity. And but she's, you know, she's not a puppy anymore, but you know, some you don't really, I don't like it when she jumps on me and her feet are muddy. So we just eliminate that possibility. 
I had a situation um, where I had just just my one dog with me, my female dog, and I got a, a bird sitting outside my window wanting to come in. Okay. Uh, anyway, sorry. It's trying to join um, the meeting. <laughs> yeah. So I go out on a trail, and I figured nobody's going to be on this section of the FLT. She's not. She's very reactive to people, and you know, I said I'm just going to take her for a quick walk. And way up ahead, I see movement and I realize it's a person. Now she starts reacting and she's pulling and she wants to bark and growl. Then I realize I know the person. So I yell, yell to him. I said, Warren, just stay where you are. And he's like, oh, not a friendly dog. I said, she's just very scared of people. So because I knew him, I turned it into a training thing. And after we we spent time and I had the treats and I threw treats to him and we spent 15 minutes together. He was petting her by the time we were done, but that was because I knew him and I was able to turn it into a training thing. If I didn't know him, I would have just pulled her off to the side and tried to keep her, her as calm as possible until the person passed because she is very afraid of people she doesn't know. So. What about encountering hikers with dogs and, and specifically dogs that approach hikers with dogs or dogs that approach yours that maybe are off leash? And I know Trisha has some good techniques for dealing with this. Yeah, I, I always blame my own dog, right? So if there's someone, I really don't want other people's dogs to approach me on the trail. That's not why I'm out there. And I think it's a little unfair to Olive. It's not what she wants. Um, and she gets general say. So as we get close, if they either look to me like they're going to approach or if they ask if they can approach, I reach right into my treat pouch, pull a handful of treats out and say, oh, I'm sorry, my dog's in training. She's not allowed to say hi right now. And I immediately look right down at her, put her on the opposite side. I've taught her switch so she can switch from side to side. And I just keep moving, talking to her. Oh, it's a good girl, Olive. Nice check-in. And just keep moving. Um, if anything, I pick up speed. And that tends to work really well. I use the same excuse if I encounter an off-leash dog where the person's in sight. So I can easily say that. I'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. My dog is in training. And I'm trying to keep her away from other dogs right now. Or I might even lie. Olive's the friendliest dog in the world. But I might say, oh, she's not always real friendly with dogs on leash. You know, and then would you mind grabbing your dog? Or, you know, could you just let us pass? I'm not even necessarily going to tell them to put their, or ask them to put their dog on leash. You know, I'm just going to make it clear. Can you please let my, my dog and myself freely pass? Yeah, and that's 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 important. You know, you get out of the situation as fast as you can. And uh, you know, I said it. You know, same thing. I've I've some of my dogs have been the friendliest dogs in the world, and just how the person approached or whatever. I'm like, I'm sorry, they bite. You know, she bites, he bites, and and I'm like, and I get out of the situation as quickly as possible because I didn't like how the person approached. It wasn't a safe approach for my dog. And I needed to get us out of there. And I right away just said, you know, my dog's not good with other dogs or, you know, he bites and I move, move along as fast as I can because I, I don't want to have that, that problem. And I also don't want to go into a huge conversation with the people trying to tell me that, oh, your dog bites and you show, you know, why are you on a trail or, you know, let me teach you how your dog shouldn't bite. Like I, I don't need an hour lecture from a hiker. <laughs> you know? So I'm going to move on to, to, to Tr Trisha's tips. Um, and this is a lovely picture of Olive. Uh, so I don't know, Trisha, you have a whole list of things that you share with folks before they take their dogs out on the trail. So I just wanted to see of the things that we didn't cover, perhaps. What, what would you recommend? 
Yeah, you know, we we covered the majority of things on the trial, but I start out, you know, given what my job is, my job is more preparedness. So I don't want to be out on the trail with a client trying to teach their dog how to walk on a leash, for example, um, because there's too many stimuli. I would so much rather before I even take a dog out, you know, I'm going to give them the leash skills in less challenging environments and then work up to, okay, my dog's on leash on a trail. There's a squirrel, there's an off leash dog, you know, there's, you know, kids approaching with their hands waving. Um, that's Olive's least favorite. So it's things like leash walking, um, how to manage gear. So if you are going to use a tether or a leash, you know, how best to manage that in an outdoor, in an outdoor location. Um, I want to make sure they've got a harness um, that fits properly with a collar so that they're not slipping out of it. That, like we talked about before, they've got double ID on. I work a lot on polite greetings. So sometimes no matter the best of my efforts, here I am faced with a person and a dog saying hi. And, you know, for me, a lot of it is, I mean, I see a lot of clients out and I may not want Olive to say to say hi, but I'm not going to be rude. So I find myself in this situation. So I want to make sure that my dog or a client's dog um, that I'm hiking with, it has the ability to know how to do a polite greeting, both to people and to dogs. And then the other thing is preparing the person for what, what if something goes terribly wrong? So you've done all the right things and the other handler makes an atrocious mistake. Or, you know, I was hiking with a friend not too long ago. We we're going down a steep decline and four deer ran within 10 feet of us across the trail. Um, so those are the things that you can't necessarily prepare for. But I can, the way I describe it is I give my clients a toolbox. So these are your tools. These are the things that you can do. You know, you can stop, move off the trail. You can turn and walk the other, dire the other direction. You know, you can dig your heels in and hope your dog just doesn't take you down in the case of the deer. Um, but I've got a plan for every situation. And then I work to build up both the muscle memory and the confidence of both the handler and the dog that when those situations happen, they are prepared for it and can make that split second judgment of what's the right thing to do. Excellent. Tricia, one, one of the, um, one of the uh, slides um, we had up talked about, you know, wild animals and you, and you just mentioned, you know, deer you come across deer um how do you train for your dogs to not mm -hmm. chase deer or chase chipmunks or uh any wild animals or even cows and horses in in farmers fields yeah i've got a client i'm uh, doing that with right now uh he's a big fan golden retriever big fan of goats um so there's a few things I do. One is I teach patterning exercises. So I usually use a simple pattern of one, two, three. And Chrissy, we may have done this together. We do, and it worked. My son worked with, with Chidi with it a lot, and it works really well. Yeah, so dogs like patterns. Uh, they like consistency. So I teach one, two, three, which is on three, a treats, you know, food's going to hit the floor. So I start with three and I'll, you know, I'll just train three, treat, three, treat, three, treat until my dog is anytime I say three, looking around for where that food on the ground is. And then I do two, three, 
and then one, two, three. Um, having the entire pattern is much more powerful in the dog's brain and in the way dogs learn than just doing three, which is why we do the full pattern. Um, and it gives them a moment to recognize that the pattern's starting. Um, once you've got it classically conditioned, so once we're, you know, in a Pavlov's dog situation where my dog doesn't ne even need food on three, they hear three and they think something great's going to happen. I should stop and pay attention to my mom. And it doesn't matter that that great thing doesn't materialize. They get oxytocin released in their brain, even though there wasn't food. So it's win-win for them. They're like, oh, I heard three. I feel great. And that's a great way to snap them out of a moment of that. I also might do some scent training. Um, so teach them to move away from certain scents. So you can buy, I mean, you can buy really almost any scent. So whether it be fox urine or deer or, um, you know, coyote, anything you might encounter. And then I might work to teach my dogs to move away from that specific scent, just like you might something that they would see or something that they would hear. But those are my two biggies. And the, the patterning does work. And if I can get Chidi on like, oh, like a, it, as soon as I see him, if I can get that one out really quick, it snaps him out of that immediate impulse to pull. But sometimes I lose him. Yeah. <laughs> but it does work. <laughs> see, the, see the white dog that's on the screen now? That's my female. And she needs Trisha to train her to avoid all wild animal poop because that white dog loves to roll in in animal poop and she needs to avoid animal poop <laughs> well my aussie olive does the same and she's all white on one side and never rolls on the brown side always rolls on the white side <laughs> and the the other one on the screen um is Bo. he's a, a red uh border collie he wound up getting lost in the woods. We spent um, 64 hours lost. Um, and Lisa could tell you, we, um, I had to do search parties. Um, I don't even think I was speaking coherently. I was so upset with what was going on. Uh, he was ultimately found uh, by a logger on the next road over he took off on my property he wasn't on anybody else's property he was on my property and he when he was found he was full of porcupine quilts so um it became obvious that he's a uh, uh, heavy heavy um prey driven mm -hmm. dog so he if he zones in on something he is gone so He's on leash um, and he doesn't have that same freedom on, on our property even because of that. Um, he, I did have this story about him in the FLT News Magazine. So if you're a member of the FLTC, you, you probably saw the story. Uh, I was a complete basket case, but that can happen on a hike. You hear a lot of stories about yeah dogs and porcupines. I believe it was our interim executive director who recently had her dogs porcupined. Um, so what do you do? You know, my recommendation in that situation is you get back to your car as fast as possible and you get to a vet. Um, some people feel they could pull quills themselves. Um, it's not easy. Um, it, if a quill gets close to an eye, they can blind the dog. If they get too far down in the throat, um, they could kill a dog. So um, keep that in mind. You know, when, when you're hiking, you have fallen logs. Porcupines like to be around fall, fallen logs. That's where um, a lot of them nest or sleep, whatever you call it with porcupines. They're not, I'm not a fan of porcupines. Uh, I'll tell you that much. The um, other issue that we've had on a trail with dogs and animals is 
farmland. You have cows and horses and you have somebody hiking with a dog and they're off leash and that dog takes off into a farmer's field and is now chasing a, you know, a cow. Um, they might have to put that cow down if it's that serious enough trauma to a cow. It could kill, a dog chasing a cow can kill, a, like it could ruin a cow. And, and that, you know, so, you know, when you, when you're out there and you're like, oh, who cares? He's only chasing a cow. No, it's, it, you know, this is somebody's livelihood and, and the life of that cow is, is in your hands now because your dog chased them. Um, a horse could kick your dog and kill your dog. Um, so keep, keep that stuff in mind. You want to have a good time out there. Um, but think about the environment. Um, I know one thing we absolutely missed covering, unless Lisa said it and I didn't hear it. Um, I carry Benadryl, mm -hmm. not just for me, but for the dogs. Um, again, on my property, which I, I have 85 acres, so I could kind of hike on my property. My, um, my dog got into uh, a ground nest of bees and brought that ground nest up. So we all got to be stung and by the time we got back to, and I'm now all of a sudden the crazy parent who never like ever hit her dogs or yelled, yelled at the dogs is now punching and swatting my dogs to get bees off of them, get bees off of me. I'm freaking out. Now we're running and we run back to my house, which took a while because we were pretty far into my property. And I got back to the house and realized that bees they were hornets they were under trip collar so when i pulled the collar off there was hornets there still stinging him and so like i ripped harnesses off and the leashes the collars off and and i'm like punching my dogs and um i right away shoved benadryl down their throat you know because of it but um talk to your vet the other thing About I have in the first aid that. kit with Benadryl is I have a little note on what dose to give her because oh. in that situation, I'm not going to remember how much I'm supposed to give her. So again, about the Benadryl, make sure it's not the stuff with the xylitol in it. The xylitol will kill your dog. Yes. Now, Peg, do you want to talk about the GPS collars? Um, you with your GPS collars. So going back to Bo and getting lost, I had a GPS collar on all my dogs and how the gps collar works is it's synced with my cell phone and i have the the one part on me and they have one on on their collars um you hit a certain mountain range and we lost connection like i it didn't find him i went right to that exact spot where the gps lost him he wasn't there and it was because it lost connection so uh, I am a proponent of GPS and I'm not a proponent of GPS because it has its limits. So there's a lot of commercials out there now for buying um, GPS collars for your dog. So your dog doesn't get lost. If you're out hiking with your dogs or even people that have hunting dogs put GPS collars on them. Um, there's pros and cons to those things. Uh, the battery life isn't that great. And the company, because trust me, I, I contacted the company. I was a little upset. Um, and we talked for quite a while and it was like, oh, it's the terrain. They, you know, if he went over a hill, I'm like, I can't say what I'm thinking. Um, so there are some other ones out there that say, oh, they work better. They have antennas on them. So now you got an antenna sticking off your dog's collar which i'm not super thrilled about that but then they're like but you know if they're lost then you turn it on it's like wait a minute how far well okay it could only go two miles okay it's only going two miles and my dog's lost i don't know if it's going to work so if you do look into them really ask a lot of questions about the different terrain the fact that many places we hike on the flt specifically do not have G, uh, self service so does that GPS require cell service? Um, how, what is the distance? What about the mountain terrains? Like you're on one side of the gorge and on the other side of the gorge, you lost the signal. So I had a false sense of security with that GPS. 
and I learned I learned a lesson with it. Um, so I, again, I'm not totally against them, but you know you got to be really careful if if you're going to rely on it. So. Any other questions? Anything I, see, we can I think cover? Sarah had asked about ticks. Oh, and yes. One of the things in my pack is a bottle of all natural Green Mountain tick repellent, which is for ticks and fleas, and it works for black flies and stuff. Her hiking, her little hiking reflective thing gets pretty much soaked, saturated in that before it goes on her. And then I spray some on a paper towel and I wipe her legs and her, around her ears and stuff like that. So. Hopefully that you is found have, have you had ticks on her? Well, she yes. Um, usually the most ticks I find on her are in January. Uh, I think that her record is 12 after a hike in January. She's white, so they're easy to see. And in January, I don't think to use this. So that was my fault. <laughs> okay. Right. But this does, um, I spray this on me too. And it does, you know, instead of 12, I might have two. And of course, when we come back, we always do tick checks anyway. So. Yeah, we have a we do have a presentation on FLT Connect that talks about ticks. Um, yep, no, I have it. I was on it. Yeah, and the um, allegedly on the label of the permarithrin, you could use that on your pets, on your dogs. I don't spray that on my dogs um, because I can't spray it on me, so I'm confused as why I could spray it on them. So I don't, but um, I. I use a, you know, recommended pet tick product from the, you know, from the vet, you know, that I put, you know, once a month on my, on my dogs and the ticks that I have found on my dogs are dead um, because they have this tick product that I use. From yeah, the I, vet. I use the monthly and I use this as a repellent when we do go out in the woods. So. Yeah. And I do have a, a herbal one like Lisa has that I could spray on as extra. And even so doing tick checks is so important. And right. the dogs love it. <laughs> love He's black. <laughs> oh dear. Oh My condolences, Sarah. <laughs> and the other thing I do before we get back into the car after a hike is I fluff her all up. I just rub her all over and hoping if there's any loot, because you know, at that point they haven't dug into her skin. So hopefully that takes some off too. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? We're we're after eight, but we can. No, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank and you very much. Uh, I, like check out um, Trisha's website, yourthinkingdog.com, for training tips. And so I will write that down. And thank you all for thank you for being here. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Peg. Thank you, Christy. Um, Yep. Thank you. Uh, this was this was great. I, I I learned a lot. I I feel like this. I feel like look at what Lisa carries. I'm like, dang. <laughs> so, <laughs> be a Find better out. dog owner. <laughs> I, I'm doing I'm doing part of the Genesee Valley Greenway this weekend, so it won't be an FLT hike, but it'll be close. <laughs> well, let me know how it works. <laughs> I mean, well, good. Like like I show you know we run in our club once in a while. We run dog hikes. And uh, I haven't done one in a while. We need to do one again. Um, and people who have never, ever hiked with their dog come out. And it's an experience for them. And they really learn a lot because we'll, we'll cover stuff as we're hiking. And we'll talk about, you know, different things you should be doing and not doing. And, you know, just the harness thing is a huge issue for a lot of people. Like, oh, I never thought of getting a harness. And it's like the poor dog's pulling and choking the whole hike it's like that's not healthy yeah. <laughs> you know so but yeah getting together with a group of group of dog loving people to hike is a really fun thing to do if it's if it's handled appropriately all right well thank you everybody i'm thank gonna you. stop